All right, your first name? Marcus. Normal spelling? M-A-R-C-U-S. And your last name? D Carvalho. It's capital D-E space capital C-A-R-V-A-L-H-O. Your title? I am the medical director of Beaches Recovery. Okay. First, let's talk about what is addiction. Okay. So, um, and that's really a great question. Addiction is essentially a hijacking of your brain, meaning there's an area in your brain that you and I have evolved as human beings that allows us to get pleasure from things that keep us alive. So food, you eat a meal, you feel good, you continue to do it and it keeps you alive. Sleep, you continue to sleep, it gives you reward and a feeling of goodness, you continue to do it, it keeps you alive. If you stop those two things, your body will go into almost a withdrawal state and make you go after food and sleep and you'll do everything possible to get those things. That's called the pleasure reward pathway and it's in the brain. It's also called the mesolimbic system, but we, we call it, we like to use that term, it's easier to understand, pleasure and reward. The problem is, is that you can introduce other things to that area of the brain like alcohol, heroin, pain pills, nicotine, and the brain begins to believe that it needs those things to survive just like food and sleep that you have evolved to need to survive. And so what ends up happening is in that area of the brain, once you're using it, and we have, there's documented research that shows just one use can do it. It's not just chronic use, okay, because that was a theory for a while, but just one use can actually make your brain believe it needs these things to survive. And we, we use the term hijacked. It's almost as if your brain is taken over. So when you go through treatment or say you just stop cold turkey and somebody says you just need to stop and you go out there and you don't continue to work on your sobriety daily, your brain is always gonna be vulnerable and that's the key. Mm -hmm. Sobriety and vulnerability, meaning you can be sober but on a day to day your brain is always going to be vulnerable to that thing you introduced to your brain. So what happens is that people are like, well, there's no hope then. There's no chance that I'll ever be able to live a full life sober. The hope is actually in the frontal part of your brain. We call it the frontal lobe, okay? So we have the brain reward pathway in the middle of the brain, and we have the front of your brain. And what does the front of the brain do? It says, this is right, this is wrong. I wanna be sober. I wanna be an awesome dad. I want to live a real life. I don't want to do these things anymore. Mm -hmm. And there's a battle between the front and, and the middle of the brain. The problem is, is this, is that the middle of the brain, since it was designed for you to survive, okay, this is about survival, life and death, and that's what the middle of the brain believes. It believes it needs that heroin to survive. So it's always strong, it's always charged, it's always ready to go. And this is the main point, is that the front of the brain is not always strong. That's where the hope lies. If you work on that front part of your brain, the prefrontal cortex or the frontal lobe, every day, you go to AA, you go to Celebrate Recovery, you go 60 to 90 days in treatment, okay, and you're working on your sobriety every day, that frontal lobe is stronger than the brain reward pathway, and we call that sobriety. Mm -hmm. The moment you let the frontal lobe drop, and you're like, I don't really need to go to groups anymore. I'm doing good. That was a part of my life in the past. I have priorities. I've got to work. I've got to do all these things, which are true. But you don't make sobriety the most important thing of your life, and the frontal lobe drops below the brain reward pathway. We call that relapse. And before you know it, you're right back where you were because that brain is asking for that heroin. And here's the reason why. Food and sleep produce this reward chemical that make you feel good, and that chemical is called dopamine, okay? Dopamine, we've evolved to have that in our lives to survive. If, if we didn't have that, we wouldn't be here as a human race, okay? It even actually is produced at really large amounts when we have sex, we have children, and we can survive, so we continue to do that, okay? The thing about food and sleep, we have a baseline dopamine level that we produce when we have food and sleep. We'll give it a number, a hundred, right? Mm -hmm. You do heroin, it's gonna produce a thousand times more than food or sleep. So does that mean your brain isn't expecting you to have that 1,000 experience? Exactly, exactly. So those things that produced a hundred experience are insignificant. What are other things that produce a hundred? Great memories, a relationship, a career, 
going to see your kids um, in, a, in a baseball game. And those things do not become a priority more anymore because the brain is like, this 1,000 is the priority. It doesn't really know right or wrong. That's the frontal lobe. Mm -hmm. But the middle of the brain's like, I want that 1,000. And there are other things that can produce even more than that, like crystal meth, massive amounts more. So all those things that are required for a full functional life are insignificant. And your brain is all about, where do I get the next heroin? How do I use? How do I hide it? How do I make the money for it? So it's an experience that's really unnecessary for us in, those, in that high. Right, right. So we, we don't need that to survive. But actually, that area of the brain is an incredible area. I mean, think about it. All the great memories that you've had in your life, and you can go back. Uh, even if you think of a great memory right now and it puts a smile on your face, that's because you're producing dopamine and it's making you feel good. And that's what it was designed for. Even as parents, when we look at our children and they smile at us and it gives us joy, we continue to go after that joy with them and it produces a great mirroring experience and great development for our kids because of that release of dopamine. But then you put in heroin into the mix and it shuts that down. So you can't even function as a parent anymore. So really the hope lies in going after strengthening the front of your brain. And so here at Beaches, what we try to do is we actually, exactly what I just shared with you, we teach that to the clients. I'll do a class and I'll get in front of everybody and we'll talk about what is addiction, right? We'll sit in front of them and say, what is the opioid epidemic? We teach them what's going on. Um, and we talk about alcohol. This is weekly, right? So they get this information so they understand because the number one thing that people like Alan tell me when I see them when we do detox is like, why do I continue to do the things I don't want to do? I don't want to live like this, but there's something going on in my brain. Imagine how frustrating that is. Like you have no clue what has happened to your brain and how it's been hijacked. And what ha ends up happening is that because they don't have those answers and they're so overwhelmed, they just continue to use. But now when they know like, wow, this is really something in my brain, they actually have a better chance at and recovery. I'll ask you this question. You may or may not have an answer for me on this then. This, a lot of this is coming from medicine. That's a great point. So why would, why would a pharmacy or a scientist create this type of medicine when it has that type of impact on the brain? Or did they not know that when they were creating it? Right. It's a great question. So actually, in our class we do here at Beaches, what we do is we look at this chart and we go back to 1990. And in 1990, we didn't see this problem with opioid pain pills. Actually, opioid pain pills were reserved for patients with cancer pain, terminally ill patients who were in significant amount of pain. But there was a push in 1990 to 1991 by the pharmaceutical industry to really push opioid pain medicine. As physicians, we were trained to look at four different vital signs. When you come in, we look at respiratory rate, fever, blood pressure, heart rate, all that, four vital signs. But as physicians during that time and the push by the pharmaceutical industry, we were said, hey, there's a fifth vital sign now and it's called pain. And so you can walk in any hospital and you'll see the charts, a sad face and a smiley face. What's your pain level? Eight out of 10 aggressively treat that pain. And what did we do? We started giving massive amounts of opioids. And that, if you look at a graph, it just starts to spike where people are going up and up in their prescriptions. And as we started doing that, and there are plenty of graphs out there, especially by the CDC, where you're looking at accidental overdose deaths, paralleling prescription pain, prescriptions being written. And so one of the questions is like, well, where are we getting all these pain pills? I mean, we are 5% of the world's population. World's population? We use 85% of all opioids. Well-known number, right? Well-known number. And in fact, some people are even saying, because we use so many opioids, other countries don't even have a supply because of the United States. Now, the, the thing is this, is that people are saying, well, where are they getting all these pain pills from? Is it the drug dealers on the street? Who's doing this? Really, it's physicians writing prescriptions. And this has been well-known, and you can find some really elaborate charts on it, is that when you get it from a friend or you get it from a loved one, usually it could be brought back to physicians are writing these prescriptions. A lot of the prescriptions, they're doing this with good intentions. They're actually looking at somebody and they're struggling with serious pain. And they're trying to 
to treat that pain and they've been trained to treat pain aggressively. Mm -hmm. But what we're finding is the majority of the pain prescriptions, pain pill prescriptions, are coming from doctors. And there is a huge movement in medicine today as far as how do we treat pain now? What, what should we be doing? Should we be continuing with these pain pills? Should we be giving higher dose NSAIDs? And it's something that if you go to any conference, we're talking about. And the more we're educating each other as far as colleague to colleague, people who have advanced training in addiction, um, I mean, I think that over time we're definitely going to see a decrease. I think there is hope for this. What is the answer? Because people are dying. So essentially, you know, we have medications out there like naloxone, which is also called Narcan. Um, and what we're seeing is a huge uh, spike and increase in Narcan sales. Uh, so what, what is Narcan? So when somebody takes an opioid or heroin, okay, um, I'll use the term opioid to define heroin and pain pills. I'm just going to use that as a general, a general term. When somebody takes an opioid, Okay, and they first take it, like Alan said, and it, what he said is very typical. I started out with Percocet tens, okay, and you know Percocet is a medicine that's an opioid combined with acetaminophen. So ten is really ten three twenty five is what we call it, um, and they start out with two or three a day, and they get that high, okay. When they continue to use that medicine, that medicine has something called tolerance to where in order to get the same initial high over time, they're going to have to increase the dose of the medicine in order to get that same high. The problem is that as you increase any opioid, the side effect is that it turns off your ability to breathe when you sleep, or it just completely turns it off even when you're awake. And we have an ability to breathe in two ways. As we're talking right now, we're not thinking about breathing, but we're breathing. The moment I ask you to breathe, your brain can switch to that and that area gets turned off. So when you go to bed, you fall asleep and you just stop breathing and you pass away. We see a lot of celebrities, a lot of people die that way, accidentally. What Narcan does is that when there's an opioid in the receptor in your brain giving you that high and say you've taken so much that you stop breathing and you fall, just like how Alan was in the airport, when we de deliver the Narcan, it actually blocks that receptor from any more opioids binding and then it competes with the opioid in there and pulls it right out. So literally, what should happen with an opioid like Percocet, morphine, hydrocodone, is that the patient should literally just wake up right then and there. It's really impressive to see. Mm -hmm. Here's the problem now with what we're finding, is that there are medicines out there right now that people are actually lacing heroin with called fentanyl mm -hmm. and carbofentanyl. Now, what happens is that fentanyl, okay, is a hundred times more powerful than morphine. It's still considered an opiate. It's still considered an opiate. And what is fentanyl? Fentanyl is something that we have put in a transdermal patch that actually is supposed to be distributed over 72 hours. It is very, very powerful, okay? Now, if you overdose on fentanyl, which is what happened to Alan, and you fall to the ground, and I give you um, Narcan, it's not even going to work. I actually have to hook you up to an IV bag of Narcan in order for it to work because it binds to that receptor so tightly the Narcan is insignificant. In Kentucky, where Alan is from, what we actually found out was that it wasn't just fentanyl that somebody was lacing the heroin with there. There was 54 overdoses in I think 36 hours. Mm -hmm. It was carbofentanyl which in 1970 was designed by Janssen Pharmaceuticals to actually treat elephants. Not, not, not humans. humans, okay? And so what drug dealers are doing, or people who are cutting heroin, is since you've developed that tolerance, and that's why I was talking about that, since you've developed that tolerance, and Percocets aren't gonna work anymore, regular heroin's not gonna work, they're still chasing that, they want high. They wanna get high, so these chemists are actually putting the fentanyl or the carbofentanyl in there and saying, this is gonna get you really high, I mean, because this is really strong stuff, and they don't even realize they're being handed the bag that's just gonna kill them like that. And so when you have that carbofentanyl in there and you get Narcan, one, two, three doses, and just like uh, Alan said, he was given adrenaline, which is also called epinephrine, and we, you know, that's like, bam, we put that in there because this guy's heart stopped beating and epinephrine's gonna get that heart to start going and hopefully he'll survive. That's actually what happened to him. So you're saying overdoses are happening, 
opiates, a lot of people are using that. Heroin is something people are using if they can't get their hand on opiates anymore. That's right, that's a big thing because what we found is that one Oxycontin tablet is worth $30, okay? You can get six doses of heroin for $9. So what we're seeing now is patients that, and just like Alan was talking about, he started out with pain pills. And the access to heroin now, I mean, the drug cartels are not dumb. And they've brought down the, the prices significantly. They've made it accessible. And why are you going to struggle to buy one Oxycontin pill for $30 when you've already spent $300,000, which he's talked about, which is very common to hear over a lifetime. And you can get something cheaper that will give you six to nine more highs. But that thing is laced with who knows what. And so in 2014, we found 14,000 deaths okay, in the United States from overdosing. The, the CDC in December put out um, that there were 30,000 deaths in 2015, more than double. There is no illness, no disease, car accidents, nothing that are killing more people from the ages of 25 to 55 years of age do you in think the United States. Do you think people are aware? Everyday people are. <clears throat> do you people think are they becoming really more aware. Over the weekend, actually, um, a group of people that I had met with and we, we were talking about what I do, whatever, the first thing that came up was what's going on with these pain pills type of thing. And I'll just, I'll tell them everything I'm telling you as much as possible. People are becoming more aware because their loved ones are dying. When I do most of these talks, I usually ask in the room, how many of you here have been resuscitated with Narcan? And they'll raise their hands. How many of you have actually died and were brought back to life? They'll put up their hands. How many of you know loved ones that have died? And all of them, all of them, you know, two hands go up. Loved ones, friends, that is becoming commonplace. And these are people that didn't want to die. They just, maybe they didn't have the best treatment. Maybe there were still issues in their development when they were young that were unresolved that they're trying to escape from, you know. Maybe they were more genetically predisposed, you know, to addiction. There are a lot of different reasons and etiologies of why people do this type of stuff. But once that brain gets hijacked, and the way Alan said it was like, it's so much more complex than just stop. I mean, it is, it is a brain disease because there are brain changes that are happening. But I think that the more we educate, the more we do stuff like this, the more, you know, different towns and cities are really making this like, look, this is killing our, our teens, this is killing our loved ones. This is where we have hope to do that. So I want to ask you this then, because the data that I have is from Duval County, the Jacksonville Fire and Rescue Department, and it shows on here just from two, January of 2015 to December of last year that the use in responding to overdoses, the use of Narcan is just, it's going up. It just keeps mm -hmm. going up higher mm -hmm. and higher. That doesn't surprise you. Not at all. I mean, I, we're going to see that continue to go up, continue to go up. I mean, initially Narcan was an injection we gave. Now we can do it intranasally. Here at Beaches Recovery, which I think is a, just a very smart idea, is to have every one of our homes, we have patients that live in different homes here, and all of them are set up with Narcan. You know, this is a, this is a, a place where people come voluntarily to get help. Addiction is a disease of relapse, and we're aware of that. And we're not naive to the fact that that can happen. And we want to give them every opportunity, every chance. And even telling them that, hey, we have this, and they already know what Narcan is. I mean, you and I chatted prior to this that there are actually drug dealers that when they are selling heroin to their patients, they're giving them Narcan. You know, is it about saving their lives? No, it's about for them to come back and buy more heroin, obviously. Mm -hmm. But this is where we are today but it is a life-saving medicine. Okay. What else did I want to ask you? We've pretty much touched on everything. And then also, in the recovery process, talk about the misconception of 28 days and where that That's comes from. That's a great point. So, you know, when we do our class here at Beaches, we, we, we also want to talk about treatment. You know, what is treatment? Um, and a lot of people come in and they're like, hey, I'm going to do my 28 days and, I, and I've got to get back to my life. But there's no data no research that supports 28 days is going to work. That actually is a number that was created by the insurance industry as what they will pay for treatment. Really where the data lies is 60 to 90 days. And actually there are treatment facilities out there where you can go and live six months to a year. You know, those are the people that have the best outcomes. Why? One, they've disconnected themselves from their social network, the people that are selling them drugs. Okay? We are actually going in what is the underlying ideology? Is it your development? 
Is it your family, your social network? Is it your genetics? We'll tease that out and then we'll plug them into great therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, family systems therapy. And that takes time to do. 28 days, I mean, 28 days, I mean, is just hitting the tip of the iceberg. At 28 days, and I see it all the time, they'll, they'll come right back, you know? Um, but if that's all we have, then that's what we have and that's what we're gonna go with. But really educating them on what is treatment it's not 28 days. It is not. Because we're talking about 28 days versus the rest of your life, and you've been living prior to those 28 days, 20 years using, 28 days is not enough. You think that it should then be increase the threshold from 28 days? In, I, in absolutely. Medicare? I would say it should be a minimum of 90. And then after 90, after that patient has gone through 90 days, let them decide. And you know what they'll say? Hey, look, I want to relocate. I'll, I want to stay around here. The relationships I've built around here, this is very common. People who are dedicated to treatment, when they come to beaches, actually a lot of them relocate here, will volunteer here, mm -hmm. um, because they know that this is really like ground zero for them where they've started their lives again. So yeah, I, I do definitely agree with that. And then also with the usage of Narcan, I mean, this is just one fire department. You think the numbers are very similar? Oh yeah, I mean, if you did a national study on that, it'd be, it'd be definitely the, pretty much the same or even higher, depending on the um, per population, per capita of uh, drug use. Like if you were to go up into the Northeast, New Hampshire and those areas, it would be very, very high. So you think this is something every city should have? Absolutely. Everybody, any first responder should be well versed and well trained in, in the use of Narcan. The thing, what, what, what I'm recommending is that not just Narcan, but like, hey look, if I'm coming to an accidental overdose, I'm going to assume he overdosed with fentanyl. I'm going to assume that first thing. Let's get, let's get everybody ready, let's you know, get this patient to an ER, let's get ready because he's probably gonna need an IV drip of Narcan. That's what be, should be the assumption. Rule that out and then, okay, if this is just an opioid like hydrocodone or Percocet, fine. But it should be assumed because that's where we are today. It was fentanyl for a very short while, now it's carbofentanyl, and who knows what's next. Wow, and it just keeps evolving, mm -hmm. it seems. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then when did Narcan come into place? I've only heard of Narcan for about for the last two years. Right, yeah, so Narcan has been a while, uh, around for, um, I would say, longer than 15 years. I mean, we've had it for a while. Um, you know, naloxone is the actual name of Narcan. Uh, we also have something called naltrexone, which does something very similar, where patients take that orally every day, and it helps them with their craving. So it's actually an oral dose of somewhat something similar, not as strong as Narcan, but it helps them dampen their craving. Why? Because what it does is it actually blocks the release of dopamine. So, mm -hmm. so say when you have a thought, you know, there's something called hedonic tone, and this is I, I, I teach this with the with the clients is that if I were to put up a picture of a carrot in front of you and say imagine yourself eating that carrot, there wouldn't really be a lot of emotional tie to it, right? Mm -hmm. And then and all the patients are looking at it and they're like, yeah. And then I put up a, a picture of this incredible Sunday with fudge and, and they're looking at that and they're releasing dopamine and they're feeling it. That's called hedonic tone. If I were to put up a picture of heroin or something that reminded those clients of their drug of choice, it could cause a relapse. So because of that release of dopamine, even before you're using it. So why not give this patient a medicine that actually blocks that release of dopamine to prevent the craving? And that's what we do with naltrexone. So a personal question, why do you do this? Why do I do addiction? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'll, I'll get a little emotional, but I mean, I'm just very passionate about having impact on people's lives. Like, you know, I, I went into medicine and, and I wanted to have an impact as a physician. I wanted to know that I made a difference. Um, and, you know, just like with Alan, I mean, you know, I'm sorry if I'm getting emotional, but it's, there's nothing more in medicine when you, you actually see somebody come from a place of darkness and now they're like in the light functioning, having impact on other people's lives. And for me, that's everything. When I, when I look back at my life, you know, when I'm done with this, I want to remember that I had an impact, that it wasn't just I'm in and out of a job every single day. Like, I want my, my life to have value. With addiction for me, I'm very, very passionate about it. I, I work in my church. I do a lot of education there. I lead a Celebrate Recovery group there. I pour as much as I can into individuals I meet in the hospital. Um, and, I, and I really think that that's the need right now. I mean, if, if we don't have more doctors that are going to kind of take the same stance and go after this and educate, not just treat, We'll never overcome this. I mean, it's huge. The CDC has called this an epidemic, but 
worldwide, it's actually becoming a pandemic if you look at the numbers. Even though we use the maximum amount of op opioids in the, in the world, it's actually becoming a pandemic. And that's, that's without a doubt going to happen. We just still need to grow as a culture of physicians who are willing to educate and treat. Anything else you wanted to share? No. Thank you. Thank you.